So we're bringing you a new segment here on the Showbank Show called Showbank's Holds Court. And basically what it is is just kind of a bring to the table, see what you got and see what's on your mind, been on your mind the whole week. And uh, just kind of give it 10, 15 minutes. We're all going to kind of debate it and see what's going on. Uh, I know I'm about to give Randy a stroke here in about two seconds, but we're going to go ahead and get into it, Showbank's Holds Court. All right, so I've got something that uh, came to mind when we were talking about doing this segment uh, from the get-go. And I want to talk about something that's happened fairly recently and the L.A. Lakers and just their complete downfall um, and a sense of ownership and just in general. How do you let a franchise fall so far that you have your fans standing out in front of the Staples Center and doing a little, I don't know what they would call it, a protest of some sort? Um, You're just straight up negligent to your fan base. And I know a lot of people thought that bringing in LeBron James was a great idea. We'll get into that here in a second. But at the end of the day, look at LeBron James is what he's brought to your team. Look what he's brought to the franchise. It's absolutely nothing like you, what you thought it was going to be in any way, shape, or form. And then they don't assign Ty Lu to a deal. Um, they get rid of Luke Walton, who I think is actually a really good coach. I just think it didn't work with LeBron James. I mean, and Randy, I see that look. Hold on. We'll get there in a second. But look at what Luke Walton did with the Warriors. I know the Warriors are on a different level, but I mean, you can't deny that he wasn't the coach at the time. If you can't coach a team, then they're not going to win that many games. You can go ahead and answer. It's okay. What, what, uh, what, what did Luke Walton coach the Warriors? Like what? What did, what did he coach the Warriors? Wasn't he an assistant coach? Yeah, he was an assistant coach, but when Steph, uh, Steve Kerr rather, was out during whatever, whatever happened to him, he was the head coach, and they went on that winning streak. I forget how many it was. They went on a winning streak. Okay. Yeah. And it was like the legendary winning streak, right? It was yeah. like one of the best winning. And who was on their team? It doesn't matter who's on your team. I just, I just, I, no, I'm I, just no, I, questions. I know who's on the Steph team. Curry we don't need to team. go over the roster. We know Clay who's on the team. team. We know so who's on the team. So that being said, you could go coach that team and they still could have went on that winning streak. Not necessarily. They would have still won games. They would have still been uber competitive. They still would have won games. They still would have been uber competitive no matter who's at the helm of that coaching position. Mm. He did nothing. But at the same time, would they have went on the winning streak that they did without the – Is that relative? I, I think it is because, I, I mean, they yeah, haven't done that with Steve a Kerr. 50, like 50 plus one team, right? Yeah, okay. No, I, I agree with both of your points because uh, they're still going to win games. They're still going to be, you know, the best team. But at the same time, did he spark, you know, the, the winning streak necessarily and maybe, you know, tweaked a couple things that worked out in the long run? I mean... In my personal opinion, I don't think he did. Uh, you could argue that he did, and you, you'd still have a very competitive argument. I don't think he did. I don't think he did much to improve the Warriors. That was already the best team in the league when he stepped in. What so do you- I don't think – I think you, you put him into a situ- – or bring him to a situation uh, like the Lakers, and you really see – what kind of coach he is, and I think we've seen what kind of coach he is. I think I think that's fair, but well, what do you think about Steve Kerr? I think he's a good. Steve Kerr is under the Popovich coaching umbrella. He's a he's a good coach. But back to back to EDJ's point. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, go ahead and because I don't want to get off topic of, of what you're All right. talking about. So basically, what we're going to get back to is well, obviously the genie bus is off water job. I mean, and then you let go of Magic Johnson. Uh, he leaves, so I think I guess he leave, left. He didn't. They didn't. Whatever. Whatever. The mutual agreement. Blah blah blah. It's just a mess. And for you to come out and get LeBron James like you did, sign him to that deal, and then have him do nothing, and then demand that you trade the players that you drafted to get Anthony Davis. How is that going to work? How does that work? How are you going to get LeBron James and Anthony Davis a to play well together? B, get them to a championship level, and C, even get them to the playoffs at that point. So is this about LeBron James or is it about the Lakers' mess? Well, it's it's a bad move because by the Lakers to begin with. What what about LeBron James in this situation brings about the Lakers' downfall? I don't see it. Because he chased out Luke Walton. Shocker, he chased out another coach. Um, he wanted half of the players that they drafted to be traded. To Did get Luke Anthony Walton have success before LeBron came with the Lakers? How What's would you success? have success? How would you have success with a team that's not good? But you needed time. That's why you hire someone to develop a team that needed time to develop. The Lakers weren't playoff ready by Luke, when Luke Walton got there. When Luke Walton got there, excuse me. Would you agree with that? But I, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, what measures do you have, or what 
What factors are you trying to say that prove LeBron chased Luke Walton out of um, LA? I think that, like, I like... I like what EDG said, EDJ said right there, just because I think that like they should have they should have given Luke Walton time to grow with the team because you've got a coach, a young coach that needs to develop just with a team that's young and needs to develop. And I think the problem there of going out and getting LeBron James is that's it, it's not uh, conducive for a team that needs to grow. And exactly, you answered it. So this is all on the Lakers brass because. If you want a coach to really grow with that team and that roster over time, you don't sign somebody in their 16th year. That's, exactly. That's in win-now mode. Well, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I agree and disagree with you. You don't sign LeBron James. You could sign somebody else. You can't can sign. You can't. No, no, no. Just, just hear me out with this because, one, it's way too much money. But, two, I mean, think about a guy that's in his 16th season that's – I, I see what you're saying with the win now attitude because you I think you do need a little bit of that uh, you know a guy that's been to the playoffs a guy that knows what winning basketball is about and help these young players develop and I I agree with what you said because LeBron is not in a well I'm ready to help some people grow I'm I want more rings so it again like you said it it comes down to the Lakers LeBron is not conducive for this situation. But it does come down to the Lakers, and they made the call to go out and sign LeBron. But at the end of the day, he's the one that signed the contract. Yeah, but I mean, that's not on but, him. That's I mean, would you not sign the contract? Why not? It's L.A. It's I think not? I think he signed it because he thought he could do whatever he wanted. And he can. He's LeBron James. He's I know, but it, anyway. it, I mean, which is dumb. I mean, so is it is your is your grief with the Lakers brass or is it with LeBron? It's with both. Who's I, bo- who? Who do you think is more at fault, EDJ? Team wise, I would probably say the buses, but as a <clears throat> overall and as the glue molding together, it's LeBron. Because I mean, you can't just you can't. He, you've seen him do it before. You know what this guy does. He comes well, into your that's franchise. Exactly why they shouldn't have signed exactly. him? Exactly. He comes into your franchise and he demands that you get players of his caliber randomly, or he'll go to a team that he sees that actually has talent. Cleveland twice. Or once, actually, because he went back to Cleveland. That was his, you know, when they got talent. So he only goes to places where he sees talent or where he thinks he can control the entire scenario. And he thought he could do it in L.A., and that fell on his face, and it's hilarious to watch. And it really hurts his reputation, I think, in the long run. So if we already have the sample size that he wants to do whatever the hell he wants to do, it, to me, all fault falls on the buses for signing this, you know, quote-unquote cancer, Right. That's yeah. their fault. It's not his fault for signing it and doing what he wants to do. He knows what he's going to do. There's going to be teams that's going to let him do whatever the hell he wants to do, and it's their fault for signing him. Right or wrong? Also, it wasn't his fault that that uh, Magic chose to draft Lonzo Ball instead of De'Aaron Fox or Jason Tatum. It also wasn't LeBron's fault that they brought in Rondo, uh, Lance Stevenson, JaVale, JaVale McGee. McGee. Like, that's not his <laughs> fault. That is the Lakers' brand no, fault. No, yeah, exactly. But I'm not, I, as you heard, I'm not putting it all on him. But, but you said overall, LeBron James is more accountable he than is the brass. Overall. Accountable because of who he is. He's accountable because of who he is. He took the Cleveland Cavaliers, who had absolutely nothing at the beginning of his career. We're talking about in the beginning of his career. Not the LeBron James we know now. Not the LeBron mm-hmm. James that has multiple MVPs, three championship rings. I mean, three very cheap championship rings, but three championship rings nonetheless. Oh. And nonetheless, I mean, this guy is the polarized figure of basketball, right? Okay. Yeah. You don't talk about the NBA if you don't talk about LeBron James. Right. I'm with you. So the point being is that LeBron James is the reason that the Lakers are in this mess at the end of the day. Because the bus has signed him. It is the bus's fault for signing him. But you... The buses have made more terrible moves than LeBron made. Facts. Awesome. And the only reason LeBron is in play is because of the buses. That's the only reason LeBron gets to go there and make said bad decisions that you claim he made is because the buses chose to sign him. Magic chose to sign him, which Magic is somebody that the buses put in charge. But that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. Also, not to mention that this is the same organization that gave a beyond past prime Kobe 
a massive contract that they had to sit with and eat for years just out of loyalty, quote unquote, instead of doing what they should have done and, you know, let them either go, sign them to a better minimum, something to that effect, and start planning for the future. Well, I mean, there's a lot of franchises that do that. Um, I mean, if we're talking about just any sport in general, I mean, look at the baseball, look at the Royals did with Alex Gordon. Oh, no, I this mean, is all facts, but we're talking about the Lakers and no, yeah. their shortcomings. So this this was really just a, a, a cumulative fuck-up on their part. That's big that, facts. That just came to That's a big facts. as soon as LeBron got there. It's just exacerbated by the name of LeBron James. That is mm, all. They tried to throw a mandate on it with LeBron. I think like, all, all I'm saying is LeBron is looking real Obama ish right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Okay, well I mean, before everyone acts like I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm just gonna end on this point. LeBron James in history will be in the top three. That really hurt my soul, but he'll be in the top three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He'll be in the top three, but you can't deny that the guy brings troubles to a franchise. Once and once he left Cleveland the first time, he brings trouble to franchises. That's a fact. And I mean, that's why I think a lot of people like Michael Jordan more. I mean, I know he left the Bulls, but he went back to the Bulls and then won three more championships. If they allow players to have as much control as a guy like LeBron does now, back then, Michael Jordan would have had that same control. He could have, but I think the league was way different then, though. Exactly. They weren't going to allow players to have that type right, of control. Right, exactly. So to move on from EDJ talking crazy, I want to talk about something else that people think is crazy. Uh, the decriminalization in the city of Denver of magic mushrooms, psilocybin which is still a federal Schedule One drug, narcotic. Personally, I think this is a good step forward, so that way once it becomes legalized, we can actually have official studies instead of just this hearsay. Uh, what y'all think? Uh, I think I agree with you. I mean, like, we need to be able to have those studies and whatnot. We'll see really what are the effects of, of these things, you know, like mushrooms, marijuana, the, you know, like people... We don't know because we haven't had like real studies on it and whatnot. Right. So I think it's good and a good step forward, especially if it can help with, you know, whatever, whatever it may help with, you know? Yeah. Uh, and to kind of play devil's advocate to my own point, uh, there's a lot of people worried in Denver because one, it passed on such a narrow margin. And number two, they already have legalized marijuana and they feel like that's, you know, uh, bringing degradation into the city. And now that magic mushrooms won't be as heavily prosecuted, you know, as they once were, uh, they they feel like this is, you know, leading to uh, society societal decay, essentially. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that's kind of a, I mean, it's a fair point because I mean, you don't know, I mean, who may go out and do what not. You could go out and go to the dispensary, and you just got to be eighteen to go into the dispensary and buy. So. You know, you have mushrooms on top of that. I mean, who knows what the fuck you're about to do next. So what are the effects of magic mushrooms? Like what? Uh, the, some of the effects of magic mushrooms are uh, euphoria, uh, possible paranoia. <clears throat> uh, maybe some nausea could be involved. Uh, hallucinations. Uh, yes, definitely hallucinations. <clears throat> uh, and it, this is all, uh, it all varies on the amount taken. So what are the, are there any harsh risk factors? Yeah. Uh, uh, as with anything, you know, too much of it can lead to some uh, negative side effects. Like when I was talking about the nausea, uh, if you've eaten too many of them, they can cause you to vomit or, you know, things of that nature. But it's no death, like? Uh, as far as we've known, now, uh, if someone was to operate heavy machinery, like, you know, uh, a car or right. things of that nature while on magic mushrooms, yes, they put themselves at risk and others at harm, uh, you know, risk of harm. But not like a uh, overdosage. Yes, as far as I've seen, there hasn't been uh, any cases of actual overdosing and dying from overdosing. Now, the worst part is, though, is that when people talk about overdosing, you know what people die from when they're overdosing. It's not actual the drug in their system. It's them choking on their own uh, vomit. Yeah, I think, and I mean, you you hear people all the time talk about, like, you know, bad trips and whatnot. So, I mean, who knows if, 
you know, to your point of devil's advocate, just, you know, who knows what someone might do operating anything, driving or whatnot. And especially if you, you know, you just went to the dispensary, picked you up, you know, something to smoke and then who knows what what can go on from there. So, I mean, I think it's, I think it's good and bad, but at the same time, you can't just go pick up magic mushrooms anywhere because no. it's just decriminalized. It's exactly. not like they're popping up shop, you know, everywhere. And on this corner, you can get your weed, you can get your shrooms, you can get a gun, you can get, right. you know what I mean? You get liquor store, you know? So, right. I mean, it's not like it's, uh, yeah, it's just, I don't think it's too crazy, you know, with just the decriminalization because, I mean, at the end of the day, it grows up out of the ground, so, I mean. Ah, here you go. I'm just saying. Yeah, man. It just grows out of the ground, man. (laughs) I'm not saying it won't fuck you up. I'm just saying at the end of the day, it's not like, you know, you go to the liquor store and buy, you know, three cases of beer and five bottles and be fucked up, dude. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, uh, I... I don't care at this point. It really doesn't matter. I think it's basically kind of a distraction to worry about, to not worry about other things. Um, I think we've got bigger things to worry about than decriminalizing mushrooms. I mean, there's so much wrong with mental health these days that I I think, you know, it's just being ignored to the point of no return. Um, So it just doesn't matter. I mean, I think they're going to find the, pretty much the same effect they find with marijuana and whatever they find good for them. But at the end of the day, I, I just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't think it does. I mean, I feel you on that. I, I think like, I, I kind of feel you, but to go to your point of uh, mental health, like that's very true. I mean, there's, I mean, at this point, whatever we can do for mental health, I think do it. Cause like uh, a study that I was reading just a week or two ago, um, the world's depression, anger, and fearfulness rate is at an all-time high that it's never been at, uh, I think it was 2017 and then even higher in 2018. So, I mean, mm. we have a serious problem, and, I mean, whatever we can do to try to fix it, I mean, if we find studies that mushrooms can help you beat some depression or something in, you know, whatever dosage it may be, then why not, you know? And different, different strokes for different folks. And not to make this a total mental health conversation, but I think we contribute to our own downfall in regards to mental health. I think, you know, as popular as social media is, do people not think that that takes a toll on the youth's mental health? Just our, all our mental health. Like, I think that plays a big part. Social media and different things like that. Just the media, how things ought to be, as opposed to just doing your own thing. I think that plays a big part. So we could talk about magic mushrooms or weed or anything like that, but it's like we contribute to a lot of... It all boils down to self, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and very much so, and I think that almost it goes to just the culture we live in, too. Throw a Band-Aid on it. You know, don't worry about fixing the problem. We got a pill for that. We got right. this for that. We got whatever. You know? Well, I, I like what Randy said. You know, it now the social media is like culture shaping. More than anything, mm-hmm. and and um, to bounce off this point, and I know we're kind of going down a different road here, but it all ties down to the same thing. Um, you know, culture shaping is happened has happened in every generation, and there's no ifs and or but about it. Uh, the culture has changed for generations and decades and whatever, and even centuries. Um, but I think one thing remains to be clear that at the end of the day, it seems like most people generally most people can handle culture changing. I think there's just a select few people um, that culture changing or uh, social media or even, you know, to bounce off Randy's point, you know, social media bullying or whatever, cyberbullying or whatever you want to call it, um, takes a more leap of major effectively a select few amount of people. And I think that's what we really need to focus on more so of decriminalizing drugs in general. I mean, not to go on a big anti-hippie rant because it's not what this is about. It's more of a rant of realizing the real problem in front of us it's been staring us in the face for since the mid 90s um we've got a serious issue on our hands but it's just being ignored you know and if whoever's out there and whoever has the ability to do something about it please do it don't blame it on somebody don't blame it on the president don't blame it on a certain uh, governmental party don't blame it on the people that dislike you or hate you 
it's all in the group that we work together and just do it because what you're seeing with these kids that are going around with the guns, it's not because they're angry. It's not because they have nothing to do with their lives. It's simply because they are not well. That's all it boils down to. And if until we recognize that as a whole, it just it won't work. I mean, I, I, I feel you on that point. I think that though you say, you know, anybody can help do it. I think it's up to all of us. I think it's every right. person, every individual, because you know, like, we don't, just like social media, uh, I think it was Joe Rogan podcast, and I want to say it was the Andrew Yang one I was watching, and it was, they were talking about mental health and whatnot, and, you know, you don't get the same endorphins from releasing into your body as, like, say, me and you are chatting on uh, Facebook Messenger or Snapchat or, you know, whatever the fuck you want to talk on nowadays, me, us sitting here in a room all having a conversation right now is releasing different endorphins than if we were all just in our group chat. And we think it's the same thing. And, and today, in today's day and age, you know, we, we automatically think that whether, you know, it's getting likes on, on my picture or, you know, getting retweets or, you know, whatever it may be, um or followers, you don't get the same effect you do as just going out and, like, just being nice to people or, you know, opening the door for the next person that's coming behind you or, you know, you get different endorphins from actual human interaction than you're going to get from staring at your phone. And I think that is a huge problem and a huge uh, plague on us as a society right now because we just think that it's all about social media and we're not, you know... I may have been in my room for, you know, 18 hours, you know, locked away, you know, like saying I'm a teenager, a young person in the world today, and I think I'm having all kinds of social interactions, but really I'm just staring at a screen or a couple of screens playing the game with a couple of friends or, you know, talking to them on whatever, but I'm not actually having an experience because, you know, I'm not able to to feel the real, you know, what I'm supposed to feel, and then comes depression, you know, and, and that just slowly builds up and eats away at people, and I think that, you know, like you said, we've had a big problem for a long time, and I think it's just going more towards the same problem, and, you know, that fucks kids up in a big deal, and you can't get away from bullying, like, you know, right. used to, you could go to school and get bullied all day long, but you come home, you get off that bus, and you're at home, it's, you know, you have time to cope and really like, but now you got cyberbullying where you could be being attacked at 12.45 a.m. on a school night and... Turn off the screen. Exactly. I mean, just turn it off. And like, you know, we shouldn't just be handing our kids this technology every left and right, like, and just letting them go to town, like, you know, and uh, do whatever the fuck they want. I'll say this in regards to the mental health aspect of it all, just to kind of draw this point to a close. Prevention is always better than treatment. Yes. Right? Yes. So if you start off, you know, teaching your child the ways of the world and, and <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of times the health is the main thing, like actual physical health, because from studies I've been reading from uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, different gut bacteria and biomes within the body have a stronger connection to the brain than a lot of our synapses do. And the fact that the standard American diet is so terrible I feel like that is a major part of, excuse me, a, a major contributor to mental health, uh, poor mental health, should I say, amongst these children, because the gut bacteria is off. You know what I mean? Like the body isn't isn't right, isn't healthy. And that's something that a lot of people aren't educated on uh, diet wise. I mean, and, and look at, you know, just look at through the history of things and what people have been led to believe about diets. I mean what the the sugar epidemic and whatnot like sugar epidemic. dude like it's crazy to me that the food pyramid is the people scheme, like, right scheme. people really argued in the supreme court that breakfast cereal is just as nutritious as like bacon and eggs or you know whatever you want to eat you know to get like from a real meal but sugary breakfast cereal is sugary as nutritious processed sugar like some frosted flakes or something like some that's flakes, ridiculous yeah. And that one in Supreme Court. I know. That's insane. All right, moving on from the uh, magic mushroom debate and kind of into more of a ethical debate and whatnot, uh, I thought this week we definitely need to touch on the Tyreek Hill situation and what's everyone's thoughts and what may come 
of Tyreek Hill uh, the next few weeks and months and uh, into the season? And will he play? Does he stay a chief? And kind of everybody's takes on that. Well, I mean, does he stay a chief? It depends on if Clark Hunt wants to keep him or not. I think we've seen a lot of Clark Hunt going back and forth on uh, past abusers and things of that nature. Um, and I think I've, I put it on our Instagram, but that's one thing he needs to figure out. Um, who is he? Where does he stand at this point? Is he against abuse or is he all about winning? Um, if you're all about winning, that's fine. You know, you can you can take the heat for, you know, promoting abuse, um, which I, he's not promoting abuse, but that's how people look at it. Um, if you're all about winning, fine, take it that way. But if you're all about doing the right thing, you got to let him go. You have to let him go, even if there is nothing wrong and even if the reports are true, um, but it just it doesn't it hasn't looked good um, since the follow ups and everything that goes on with him. So is he is he coming back? I at the end of the day, I, I don't I don't think he will. I, don't, I think it's just too much against him at this point. Fair or not? Um, does he play in the NFL again? I think it's another point of where Roger Goodell makes an example out of somebody. And is that fair? No. But I think he's going to make an example out of Tyreek Hill and uh, ban him outright. Because now it's talking not talk, it's not, not just talking about women. It's talking about children. Right. Um, and I think that'll you know make Roger Goodell want to make an example out of Tyreek Hill if there's enough evidence to prove him guilty. More so than they're starting to look like now. Um, even though the fiance uh, aspect of it is very interesting. Yeah. See, well. that's my question because my thought process of it is, especially after these texts that came out, and if it's if it's all on her, because, you know, the like the report said in the investigation, the second time the police were called out, Tyreek Hill wasn't even mentioned. Like, he is not even a part of the re- police report. Mm-hmm. So, I think, to me personally, it looks like she tried to throw him under the bus for some stuff that she did. And then my question is, if that's the case, I mean... I mean, how do you, how do you, do you judge it differently? Because personally, then I think if, you know, if, if it does, you know, what, whatever comes out here on forward, I think at this point, I mean, what, what has he done wrong? I, well, if he, if he didn't do anything wrong, he didn't do anything wrong. Um, but, you know, she has made claims that he's, you know, hit his son in the chest, uh, right. holding his arms out open wide, um, which, you know, is not okay. Right, and um, and I means. do want to say that right. like the the child's well being is above all of this. Right. Like you know the the kid is number one. I, but at the end of the day, I mean, if it wasn't him that you know did it, I don't understand why he should get punished just because. I and the the conversation between the two, the tape does not sound good at all. At all, yeah, and it and <clears throat> and especially with his his past history, exactly, but. I still think at the end of the day, I mean, if he's, why should he be held accountable if it wasn't his doing in the first place, you know, and, and she tried to throw him under the bus to me. I mean, that's, I mean, why does he, why does he deserve to lose his job because of, well, I, I don't, I don't think they're there yet. Allegations. I don't think they're there yet. Right. Um, Right. And they're not. uh, And I mean, clearly no one's making any decisions. The NFL, the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't think, has the NFL said anything? I don't think so. The only thing the Chiefs have said that he's suspended from all activity. Uh, He's still with the team and everything. And I don't think, I don't think he's been placed on the exempt list or anything with the NFL. No, he's just, he's not allowed to be involved with the Chiefs practice wise at any time right now. Yeah. So I, I think it's a lot of just wait and see, yeah. Um, with that situation, but I don't, I, you know, I don't know. If you're looking at it as simply a Chiefs fan, I think they drafted well enough uh, to where that his replacement, um, Harmon, is uh, a good replacement for him. He's basically the exact same player, except the only difference is, is that uh, he played wide receiver his whole college career. Tyree Kill is right. more of a returner specialist. Um, so I think they drafted well in that regard. And I think that kind of maybe put the writing on the wall uh, if you're looking into cryptic, you know, things of that nature. Uh, I think the Chiefs are kind of expecting this to go towards the way of getting rid of Tyreek. Well, I think that they made that because that was before the text came out. And right. I think they made that move they may because have they known. knew. Yeah. They knew if nothing, if it, everything stayed the same, Tyreek was gone. You know, right. he he's a f- for sure out of the door. But I think with the text coming out and whatnot, I think that that does, you know, change things a little bit. And I think change things for them. And that's why he's been, 
you know, he's stuck around for as long as he has. But I think either way, the child needs to be removed from the home and, like, for good. Because I don't think that their relationship is uh, a good spot for a kid to grow up with. Or is at least what it seems outside looking in. Mm-hmm. Honestly, how I see the matter is the Chiefs are waiting till the final buzzer to make their decision. Ultimately, what you've seen with Kareem Hunt was a situation where a running back could be de- uh, replaced any time in the league. Get him off the team, we send him to the Browns, or get picked up by the Browns, and we can fill him in, and our system can move along fine. But in the case of Tyreek Hill, it's hard to make an elite wide receiver. It's hard to come across a, an elite wide receiver such as someone like Tyreek. And I think you're just seeing that um, in this case. So they're waiting for any details that could come and prove his innocence. The way I personally see it is if he's not guilty of uh, – if they, if, if they don't find evidence that finds him guilty of abuse of the child or anything of that matter, let him play. It's guys in the NFL doing far worse. And this is if Tyreek Hill is found innocent of uh, abuse of his, 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 his kid. But, I mean, it's guys in the NFL doing far worse and being allowed to play. So I don't understand why the Hunts have to take such a moral high ground in a dirty game. Does this remind you of the Adrian Peterson situation <clears throat> a little bit? I mean, I know it's a different position. Ooh, yeah, no, I forgot but, about that. Actually. Yeah, yeah, it's it's no, not really, because you're talking about a broken arm, right? As opposed That's, to yeah. just getting your ass beat with a switch, right? But I mean, they they carried it like it was worse, though. Well, and not to mention he was suspended, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he was suspended for it, and that was what he he was gone for a whole season off of that, right? I don't think whole, I think he got hurt. Yeah, he was hurt. Yeah, I don't think it was the whole season, oh, okay. but I think that he missed at least four to six games and then got hurt. I thought it was in the double digits, like ten games. I do. I think it's injury remember. exaggerated. Oh, okay. yeah, I think it was that he got hurt on top of it. But I mean, yeah, the NFL took a big stance on it. I mean, but this the, it is somewhat similar, but then you have to factor in the possible domestic violence right. with it too. You know what I'm saying? That's what kind of separates the Tyreek situation from the Adrian Peterson. It was just strictly parent on child violence as opposed to domestic violence as a whole, like, you know, the encompassing uh, spectrum of it all. But at the same time, I mean, is that even... I haven't heard anything about that. Has that even been brought up? I mean, just due to the the voice recording that we heard between him and his fiance, yeah. he, he was making threatening statements. Like I, I think... I don't know. I mean, I agree with you. Cause, and, I mean, if you go off his... Uh, past history i mean it's not and it's not like it's with a bunch of women it's mainly with this one girl Mm -hmm. um so i think that's you know that's strange too (laughs) give it up like it's yeah and especially at this point like i mean what what is the point i mean nothing good is coming out of this i mean what is the point like to the to the point you're gonna lose your nfl career i mean because if that if that kid like if he broke his arm like i mean i kind of feel you he probably shouldn't be able to play again at all like somebody another down ever right. yeah somebody i was with over at uh, a combine i was doing a couple weeks ago they brought up this good point you don't know how your kid's arm got broken because he he said he didn't know how it got broken in the recording and he said you don't know how your son's arm got broken if i knew how my son's arm got broken i would know instantly because you need to know. I mean, that's true, but also, what if he literally doesn't know because his fiance broke the kid's arm that's and true. they tried to hide it from him? Like, I'm pretty sure that's what the texts say. So, I mean, I don't know. At that situation, I think that that proves his innocence more than it does. I mean, what? Ray, you got that face on. Why? <laughs> because it, it just all sounds like BS to me. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You're an NFL player, though. Think about how much time that that takes, and that's true. But it's the off season. That's also true. But I mean, what if he's in the gym six hours a day, working out, getting ready for the next so, season? You just came up this close to a Super Bowl. That close, right? So why not? Why not be working that hard for next year so you can make the Super Bowl and you can win a Super Bowl? I mean, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. He didn't ask his kid how his arm was broken? Like, th- does he just not talk to his son? Because that's what it sounds like. I mean, maybe a bad parent. Nobody I mean, said he was shit. a good father. Exactly. Right? <laughs> but like, yeah, hey, nobody. You know, no, I'm not. not a high boss situation with the kid? What, you just I mean, feed the motherfucker? Like, what the? What? Maybe I not. mean, look at a lot of fucking dads out there. A lot of dads ain't even there for their kid as, in general. That's so, a fact, I mean, but like, the kid stays with him and his fiance. So, 
he would have to have some type of interaction with this child, whether it's a high and by basis. And then if you see a kid with a broken arm, like you, that's something jarring. Like you can ask, like, "Hey, man, what happened?" What the kid gonna say? I don't know. Kids are brutally honest. But like, like Randy just said, I mean, we're not saying he's a good parent. I'm not Maybe he's not even on a high and by basis. Maybe he come in the house and go straight to bed. With I'm the just saying. With the relationship that's been reported he has with his fiance. It's safe to say that he might not be there all the time. It's safe to say yeah. he's probably not there a lot of the time. And when he does, have, when he does end up being there, fireworks happen. Like I said, I think that that, that plays into his hand more than it plays into. I, I I totally see what you're saying because you know if your kid's arm is broke, like how do you, how do you not know? You know what I mean? Like I get that, but at the same time, like we said, we not. We we not necessarily sticking up for the dude what? saying he's a great parent, he's a role model citizen. I mean, he may not he may not even talk to his kids. Plus, I just thought about this too. With a broken arm, you have to go get medical treatment. So mm-hmm. the fiance would have had to take the child to an emergency room, doctor mm-hmm. visit, something of that. And then I'm not sure if they have insurance or not. But he would have been notified some way, like, hey, I need some money for this medical bill, or, hey, what's the insurance information? Like, we need to do this for the kid. But, I mean, what if not, though? What if what if he literally had no idea it, of... Or, I mean, it just sounds he, willfully he, ignorant. He, he probably... Which, it may be. That's what we're saying. It may be, because maybe he isn't around 90% of the time. And we're basing everything off of this 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 uh, recording, like, that's everything. Right. right. And it's right. not... We, he probably knew what the jig was. He was probably like, ah, oh, he's trying to, right. she's trying to record, exactly. she's trying to play me, so I'm going to just write. Because he, he right. sounds right. mad irritated in that, that clip. He sounds That's true. very annoyed and, you know, who knows. Yeah. yeah, who knows how long the, the conversation had already mm-hmm. been going on for. I mean, I don't know. There's, a, there's just, there is a lot of what ifs. And I think that when it comes down organizationally wise with the Chiefs, with so there being so many what ifs, I think they learn from the Kareem Hunt situation a little bit, and you know are waiting for all the what ifs to come out and did failed. they though? Because look I who mean, they just so. traded for and signed. Who has you know? Is are you talking Frank about Clark, uh, Frank Clark? Yeah, who has a past like that too? I mean, but at the same time, I'm not talking about. I'm talking about the way they're handling this situation right now. That has not. Right. I think yeah. if. Just like with Kareem Hunt going to the Browns, this situation that happened has nothing to do with your organization. I mean, you're going to deal with the suspension, but you you signed who you signed, you knew who you signed, whatever. That, you know, past is past. Let let bygones be bygones, you know, I, I think is kind of like the thought from another organization picking him up. Because, look, with the Seattle, you know, that's that's the staying there you know like coming here like i think that once you move uh organizations it kind of helps kind of take the steam off a little no i agree seattle drafted him right seattle was the team that initially made that step so i mean that's what i've agreed with from the beginning right you know we're talking about taking the moral high ground i mean hunt hasn't really taken the moral high ground like he thought like he thinks he has yeah, and but why the fuck does that even matter? I mean, it it doesn't. It's a it, it's a job that you're doing and you're trying to get done. I don't give a fuck who's you know on my right. team as long as we're winning. And if you know Frank Clark helps him win a Super Bowl, I don't think anyone in Kansas City is gonna think about anything no, he's done in it, this past. It doesn't, but it does because they cut Kareem Hunt. Yeah, but I think that that goes back to that same situation of like it didn't happen here, so it didn't happen kind of thing. You know, just like Cleveland probably feels about... I mean, even though it happened in Cleveland. I was going to say, but, it happened in Cleveland, but, didn't it? Yeah, but still, you know, it didn't happen while he was with us, so whatever. So, for my segment, I have... Or, for this segment, I have two little topics I want to bring up. I'm going to start with the Steve Harvey topic. Now, over, uh, I believe, last week on his show, Steve Harvey talked about how the rich, uh, the rich person or the rich people don't get eight hours of sleep. Right. You have to do certain things when you get up in the morning or whatever, what have you to contribute to your wealth. Um, And with that task in mind, you're not going to be able to sleep eight hours at night in there. uh, Naturally, with anything Steve Harvey says was a big uproar on Twitter. Uh, People just basically didn't agree with his take. So how do you guys feel about that? I know, Ray, you had a little disagreement. Yeah. Uh. And to kind of, you know, uh, go back to what Randy was saying, it kind of seems like 
people mainly like, you know, putting down Steve Harvey, even though this has been this is a rhetoric, you know, uh, repeated by many different celebrities. Right. I'm not sure why it's always Steve Harvey, but I'll say this to tell people that they don't need eight hours of sleep or they shouldn't get eight hours of sleep, you know, to acquire more wealth. I feel like that's it's inaccurate. You know what I'm saying? If he had told people to maximize their waking hours, fine, right? Nothing wrong with that. Because, yeah, we all have the same 24 hours, right? So those, you know, other 16 waking hours, maximize the shit out of them. Don't just, you know, get up out of bed and scroll on your phone for an hour and lollygag and whatnot. No, maximize your time. What you feel like you need to do to uh, progress forward and acquire more wealth. But that cutting out sleep, that, that just leads to an unhealthy life, which they'll be spending the money that they made trying to make up for that sleep that they lost because that leads to so many other health issues, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying about maximizing your waking hours because, you know, and everybody is different. So, I mean, you know, you, you may not need as much sleep as I do, you know, to operate and whatnot uh, on a daily basis. So I think that it's kind of a thing where it's like you kind of you kind of do what your body tells you. You know what I mean? Like you you just have to, you know, growing as a person, you know, and becoming an adult. Like I think that you really, you know, you have to learn yourself and like what you know your boundaries are and whatnot, and know like you know say, just like you said, maximize your waking hours. Exactly, you know, because know there's no exactly one size fits all when it exactly, comes to sleep. Exactly. So I mean, I. I agree and disagree with kind of what he's saying because, you know, sometimes it does take a little less sleep to get that success that you want, you know what I mean? But, you know, sometimes you got to compromise. But at I'm, the end of the day, I, I agree with you that you just need to maximize your waking hours. And you do. Obviously, you do. But what was the thing that got everybody so mad about what he said when he's basically talking about something that's been said for years? What was it about what Steve Harvey said that was so bad? It, it, it's a model of of wealth that everyone has, literally everyone has talked about. Countless and countless of gurus or what have you talk about, oh, you can't get eight hours of sleep. The days have already have gone. You got to get it. You know what I'm saying? Early right. bird. Early, early uh, bird gets the gets word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was like, Gary Vee has been spitting this rhetoric for, what, almost 10 years now? Like, you know, on our Facebooks and you know, whatever social media you have, he's been spitting the same rhetoric for, you know, X amount of time. It's I think it goes with a, a couple of things. One, just how reactive we are, especially like with Twitter and whatnot nowadays. And, you know, anybody says any little thing that, and it could just spark from like one person, maybe one person had the opinion of, well, this is fucking stupid of, you know, Steve Harvey. And that just started a wildfire mm -hmm. and, you know, starts a, you know, it to trend or whatnot. It's all good, bro, yeah. because Lil, uh, Steve Harvey is really the Lil Bow Wow talk show host. Oh, big facts. Well, that's what I was going to say, uh, was that, that I think that uh, Steve Harvey, ever since that, uh, the whole slip up with the card reading. Yeah, yeah Miss Universe stuff. Dude, I think it's just made it easy. Like, let's clown Steve Harvey. I think mm -hmm. that that's kind of almost like a, a thing, like... Let him say anything, and we're we're gonna attack it if we don't like it in the slightest. Just because it's Steve Harvey, it's easy to go after him. I think it kind of affects. Yeah, no, he's a very easy to chastise character. Yeah, so I think that it's both of those things of just being so reactive, and then not to mention that Steve Harvey is kind of, you know, he's just, he's stayed kind of in the headlines with stuff like this mm -hmm. that that people are just coming after him for, like. But, I mean, honestly, I don't think what he said was so wrong on the guidelines of look at how he moves in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you – Steve Harvey has a radio show. He has a talk show or had a talk show. I think Ray said it's getting canceled or what have you. But he's a mover. Like, he's he has all yeah. these things to do. I don't think that it's I don't wrong think what you he can, said. I don't think you can get eight hours of sleep in his position. No. Same with, like, the Stephen A. Smiths of the world. Like, you can't get eight hours of sleep doing what they do. So I think it was along the lines of, like – all right, if you really want to go get it, if you really want to be a go-getter in this industry or Hollywood or what have you, ain't no time for sleep, for real. Like, you got to really just go do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. If you haven't accomplished everything you needed to accomplish in the hours you've been allotted, then you're going to have to stay up a couple extra hours mm -hmm. and go get it. Yeah. And that's what I think he was really trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, but just moving forward, 
Um, also, there was fallout from Aisha Curry's or Aisha Curry's latest statements on Red Table Talk with Jada Pinkett Smith, and she basically alluded to her husband, um, NBA All Star uh, Steph Curry, having groupies or not having groupies, but groupies basically uh, wanting to be with Steph Curry and the attention that Steph Curry is from getting from a lot of women, and she said uh, she expressed insecurities. Um, about her lack of interest and attention from men. And there was an uproar. People said, why do you need attention from other men and your your husband just signed a $200 million contract, um, give you everything you ever wanted. He's a great man, yada, yada, yada. When the fuck did it become a crime to want to feel sexy as a person? Why is that an issue? I don't I don't think it's an issue. I think it was just a, you know, a, a simple side comment that she made. That was probably taken out of, you know, a completely different world. I can see where people get upset just because, you know, it's just, oh, it's just some other lady that wants to be famous for a whole other reason other than her husband being so-and-so, whatever, so on and so forth. But I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't see the super big deal about it. I mean, if, if she's happy with Steph and Steph, you know, makes her happy, and I mean, Steph's one of the top three best basketball players in the world right now. Yeah, nah, but go, go ahead. <laughs> no! <laughs> We're going to get into a yeah, whole yeah. other conversation. <laughs> Go ahead, bro. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to finish the point, yeah, I don't, I don't see that big of a deal in it. I mean, if that's how she feels, that's how she feels. I mean, if she, if some people just like more attention than others. I mean, if that's, if that's what she wants, then that's fine. I don't think she was saying, you know, any disloyalties towards Steph Curry. I don't think it was anything of like that. She's just saying, like, he gets all this attention. That'd be nice if I got some because, I mean, you know, she is known, too. And so I don't, I don't, I don't see the big deal. I'll say it's a bit contradictory on her part because you you want that quote unquote sexy attention, but she dresses very conservative. Not much skin is showing, and ah uh, what? Uh, why does she you to, sexist pig? Why did, but why does she? <laughs> so she has to dress. I'm not saying she has to dress like sexy. a complete whore, but this is what I'm trying to get oh, to. Oh my god! Rage went right. down a rabbit hole. Yep. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm <laughs> to get to the point. This is the same woman who was essentially slut shaming like three, four years ago. Who was she slut shaming? She, she was saying like if y'all would get off of like the internet and like you know care more towards your man, y'all would have a man. This is literally what she said. That's not slut shaming. That's saying get your shit right. Bro. Why is that so slamming? Because, bro, she's sitting there saying, like, don't be sitting there posting, like, half-ass pics and whatnot. Focus more on that man. Right? All right, bro. In this day and age, that's slut shaming, dog. Like that's not slut shaming. In this day and age, that is, bro. From, anytime from you tell people to put clothes on, that's what happens. If you anytime what, and you're telling people to put some clothes on, that's slut shaming. That's not slut shaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was saying, right. no, 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 no. She was saying, if you're gonna do all that, just pay attention to your man too. As much energy as you're putting into that, put some energy into your man. And maybe things will turn out better. That's not slut shaming. That's saying be a fucking better on point girlfriend or wife or whatever. That's how they take it, bro. I'm just saying. I I, I, I know the difference. They don't. The general public acts like they don't. So so what was so wrong with I don't see what what was so wrong with she said. I'm just saying So is it wrong for her to want to feel sexy and get attention from other men. Not necessarily because I think people think that she just wants to fuck other dudes. No, I, and that's not my thought process in the slightest. I know she's she's secure within her relationship. She does want to feel sexy. Well, if that's the case, you got to be sexy because this is the worst part. She's not an ugly woman. Right. It's the Alicia Keys effect to me because Alicia Keys is very fine but has little sex appeal. Alicia Keys is sexy, dog, and I don't want to hear it. Stop it. <laughs> Alicia Keys is Stop. sexy. She doesn't have sex appeal. Bro. Alicia Keys is sexy. <laughs> you can say that until you blew in the face. She does not have sex appeal. Why? Why don't Alicia Keys... Se- she just does. She I agree with it. you. I agree with you. Aisha Curry don't have sex appeal. She does. I agree with you on that. Because, like, okay... Look. Alicia Keys, though, dog? She does not have sex appeal. Man. She does not have sex appeal. She is She don't fine. have to say... She, she All she got to do is play a piano. I'm thinking Alicia Keys sexy as fuck. <laughs> Play that piano, baby. See well, okay, but my question is, so you, you got to be posting... I'm not saying that, but you do have to dress a bit more provocative. She wears, like, full-on, like... I don't think she has to dress... Why you got to dress provocative? I don't think she has to dress provocative. I, I think she just has to have, like... Accentuate some the features. People, not even that. I think she just has to ooze sexiness from her fucking being. And this is the whole and that, thing. That doesn't have to deal with clothes. I think it's just your aura. And I, I know women with a sexy aura that can have... 
fucking have one of them medieval ass dresses on and still be sexy as hell. Okay, yeah, because like Tiana Taylor is like one of my favorite examples, right? She just oozes sex appeal. Not even the prettiest woman ever, but just oozes sex appeal. She can have anything on. She like she basically dresses like she's androgynous. She'll dress like a man one day and then like a female one day in, in those traditional ways, right? And still oozes sex appeal. That's what I'm saying. It helps accentuate it. And she doesn't naturally have sex appeal. So that's what I'm saying. The clothes will help accentuate But then does that go back to the, you know, the uh, one in attention? Because she's uh, feeling, you know, what's the, what's the words? I'm Insecure? Thinking? Insecure, thank you. And that's part of why she's not oozing the sex appeal, like, which is what you're talking about. I mean, Ayesha Curry, she's relatively young, right? I mean, she's... Like 28, um, maybe? Yeah, so, I mean, she has three kids with Seth, I believe. I She's just not... I think she just has that mom blues where it's just like, oh, yeah, the best years of my life are kind of maybe heading down the drain or what have you. And what have I really done? Why isn't nobody finding me attractive? What, 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 what. You know what I'm saying? I think it's more mm-hmm. of that than anything. <laughs> No, bro, because I just had, like, a random thought come through my head when, uh, who was that? Mark Jackson was talking about Steph Sutton. <laughs> <laughs> he knocked that out the park <laughs> and completely ignored <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, because he was talking about LeBron White. That's who he was talking about? I think about? he was talking about Savannah. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Dude, what do you say, bro? He's he like, said, I would knock that out the park. She's all state. <laughs> <laughs> and I would knock that out the park. The fact that he said that shit like a pastor, dog. Like a pastor on live television. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. And he's seen that. Because <laughs> what, that was like in the 2016 finals? I don't even remember when he said that shit. Low-key, I think he was referring to like pitching, though. Like, I don't think he was really talking about knocking... Uh, <laughs> but you never know what Pat like. Yeah, bro. You never know what Mark Jackson. But, but just to get back on topic, man, I don't think it's anything wrong with the woman wanting to, especially women. I think everybody wants to feel sexy and feel like you know, even even niggas want to go go past the club or go past the woman and get their looks. I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna say anything about a certain co-host we have in the room right now <laughs> that may get in trouble about certain comments I may relay. So I'm gonna just say like, but uh, EDJ, I, I'm not. I, I don't want to get in trouble. You don't get in trouble. Too. Yeah, I, the views of the, Randy and myself do not <laughs> not <laughs> EDJ in trouble. <laughs> but every like everybody wants to feel like they're attractive. Everybody wants that attention, especially women. They want that valid validated. They want it their aesthetics validated. And I don't think there's a problem with that. No, and it's not an issue. But like that's the main thing I'm saying. Like so, if she just wants to feel sexy, then be sexy. Like just go get sexy for yourself, not even for anybody else. And then it'll come naturally at that point. Just go get sexy for yourself. Whatever you define as sexy, do that. Be that. Because then it'll come. You'll get the, you know, the looks or whatever that you're looking for. It will come. But you have to do it first. That's a great point because at the end of the day, that shit comes within yourself. Within. It comes from you don't You don't need to go find attention from other people to make yourself, you know, it's like Cat Williams said. It's self-esteem. <laughs> that comes from you yourself. You gotta be a whole star motherfucking player. <laughs> But for real though, at the end of the day, that comes with yourself, you know. And I think, like what you say, you gotta you gotta find what that means to you, and and be that. Exactly. That's all I'm trying to get across. But just to close this out, I got a little poem for Aisha. Don't feel insecure, baby. I got you. <clears throat> My D roses are red. I wanted your husband's team to lose. Don't feel insecure, Aisha. I see the sexiness in you. That's a wrap. Boom! (laughs) Get him off the stage!